Today, more and more of Africa is being tamed. But there are still places that are completely untouched by civilization. One of these is Karamoja. open plain, and all of it burned as brown as a lion's skin. This is the Africa we dreamed about as children, explorers' Africa. The Africa of charging buffalo, of tribesmen in war paint and ostrich feathers. the Africa which is disappearing fast. Perhaps it doesn't do to shed too many tears about it. Africa is too old and too vast to change all her ways overnight. There are still remote and distant places where the old ways linger on. A modern traveler arriving here for the first time may find this very hard to believe. Entebbe, International Airport for Uganda. When the big jet flies in over Lake Victoria and sets you down here, you are apparently a thousand years away from that old tribal Africa. 640 miles to Zanzibar, 571 to Mombasa. The terrible distances that the explorers walked less than a hundred years ago have been tamed and telescoped. No modern airline can take you to that older Uganda. If you're intrepid enough, you must charter a light plane and fly out from Entebbe. There are no landing strips where you're going, just bush. You turn away from Lake Victoria and head northeast 250 miles. The blank space on the map you're headed for is called Karamoja. <laughs> Karamoja lies hard against the Kenya and Sudan borders. It's a dry, brown land where jagged mountains leap from the plains. There are no real roads, so at present very few Europeans ever go there. Practically the only white man to leave his mark on the district was known as Karamoja Bell. Bell was probably the greatest elephant hunter Africa has ever known. In these days of saving Africa's wildlife, his activities would be unthinkable. Bell slaughtered at least a thousand elephants and made a fortune from their ivory. Today, perhaps partly because of Bell, herds as big as this are rare, even in Karamoja. They have no enemies and no animal need fear them. They are peaceful vegetarians who spend their nights feasting and much of their days lazily digesting beneath whatever trees their progress has left intact. People who haven't faced wild elephants believe it must be simple just to shoot them down. Though they're peaceable creatures if left alone, they can be appallingly dangerous when harried. The moment that you have to look out for is when they raise their waving periscopes 
Then you can be sure they've got your scent. This was the sort of situation the old pirate Bell faced almost every day of his hunting life. Nowadays, the animals have little to worry about up here. Karamoja is too remote to encourage large-scale poaching, and the tribesmen who live here aren't hunters. Under the tall, fluted columns of the Barassas farms, family parties of antelope graze the course of the dried-up Kidepo River. Karamoja is a paradise for lions. The burning dryness of the countryside concentrates their prey wherever there is water. No one hunts them or harries them. Their carefree family life sums up the wildness of the whole area. Europeans who have worked in the Karamoja become fascinated, almost obsessed by it. Yet it isn't entirely the place or its wildlife which seizes hold of their imaginations. They are in love with the tribes who live in this bittersweet land. The Karamojong are some of the most untamed people on earth. dawn in Karamoja. The homestead sleeps behind its castle wall of thick thorns. The thorns are its only protection against a surprise night attack. Only the women, children and old men live in the homestead. The warriors have more important jobs to do than just defend the old and the helpless. The village needs no alarm clock. There is one on every thorn bush. A bird chorus of Dano's barbets calls them as soon as the sun is up. Soon the sun will blaze down, and with the heat will come the flies. The cattle who have been driven in for protection from raiders during the night must be milked before the flies begin to torment them. The Karamajong are a warrior people who count their wealth in cattle. Cattle will buy a bride. Cattle are a man's badge of rank. The children who have slept naked on the hard earth shiver in the morning air. Soon, work will warm them up. Work here is for women and children only. In this harsh land, where every ounce of nourishment is needed to keep cattle and human beings alive, the villagers are not inclined to waste food on pets. Even this young ostrich has a pet. He will provide plumes for a warrior's headdress. In the lean months, when the rains are still a long way off, all life centers on the struggle to find enough to eat. Cows are never killed purely for meat, but they do provide a little milk. At this part time of the year, the main herds are many miles away, searching for fresh grazing. When the homestead cows have been milked dry, they'll be driven away to the cattle camps where the warriors guard the herds. There, they'll be exchanged for fresh beasts. This village is a G.A. village. The G.A. are one of the five tribes that make up the Karamajong. They're all much the same kind of people, but they're far from united. Their national sport is raiding each other for cattle and women. In a totally man's world, a woman's main purpose in life is to raise another generation of warriors. It's surprising that the children grow up so straight and strong, but there's seldom much food to spare for anyone. Porridge made of skinned milk and ground millet is the stuff on which Karamajong mothers must produce a future race of fighting men. (laughs) 
With full daylight, all risk of a surprise attack by the Bakora, the rival tribe to the north, has disappeared. The thorn branches guarding the entrance are taken down and the cattle driven out to water. Now the children can safely leave the settlement too. All have jobs to do. These boys keep an eye on the herd from a rock high above the village. They're not alone there. This rock has a special significance for the settlement. A long time ago, a greatly respected chief brought some hyraxes here and gave orders that the little animals were never to be molested. So now the rock is a kind of shrine, though the village has long since forgotten why the hyraxes should be regarded as sacred. In this burnt brown land, water controls all life. This homestead is far luckier than most. Many years ago, the villagers tapped a hidden spring. Now, most of the dry season, there's a permanent water supply. In Karamoja, this is a rare luxury for cattle, goats, donkeys, and human beings alike. One of the first chores for the children is to do the washing up. They clean the gourds in which their mothers have prepared the first meal of the day. Whatever other shortages there may be, cooking pots are no problem. Each wife grows her own gourds, which she neatly splits in half to make all her household utensils. When the bowls have been filled, each child puts a wreath of grass on his head as a kind of cap to help balance his load. It's nothing unusual to see a ten-year-old carrying four gallons of water in this way. Work is for women, not for warriors. Each wife has her own plot. If she's a very junior wife, she may have to walk three or four miles from the homestead to find an uncultivated piece of bushland. She'll plow as much as a couple of acres, and there she'll plant maize, ground nuts, gourds, millet, and marrows. She not only plows the soil, but she grubs the harsh thorn scrub from the land with her bare hands. No GA man worth his spear would touch such menial work. When it comes to sowing, she broadcasts the seed with a graceful flick of the wrist, which long experience has proved distributes it most evenly. If the rains fail, her meagre crop may come to nothing. Then she and the other women have to rely on wild greens, scouring miles of baking bushland to collect perhaps just a gourdful. Where life is as hard as this, very few grains of seed can be spared for the marauding doves. So all through the blistering day, the children act as scarecrows, waving their stick-thin arms so that next season's granary may not be empty. In these dry months, nothing comes amiss as food, 
even termites. Each woman in the village has her own anthill. The aristocrats of the ant heap are the winged termites. They are the princes and princesses who will fly away to start a new colony. After a short while, their wings drop off, and then they find a hole in the ground and start a new generation there. It's these succulent winged insects that the women are after. When the winged ants are ready to fly, the women build a rough framework of sticks over their exit holes. Then they lay a cowhide robe on top of the sticks so that it forms a roof. The open end has to be exactly the right width. Next, they weight the hide down with loose earth. Now, when the winged ants try to fly out, they'll find themselves trapped in the darkness. It's impossible for them to escape, and so they flap about until they shed their wings. The hole is dug to collect them. So that the victims can be collected easily, the women build a kind of chimney out of wet clay. They shape this as skillfully as if working with a potter's wheel. All this activity stirs up the worker ants, but they're no good as food. When the birds come around, it's a sure sign the flying ants are ready to emerge. When it rains, the ants hatch out in great numbers, so the women will bang on the trap from time to time to imitate rainfall. All boys must grow up to be warriors, so any time they get between chores, they practice spear throwing. Despite the toughness of the life they lead and the amount of work they have to do, the children manage to have a good deal of fun. Few African youngsters laugh and play together, particularly in the towns. But here in the untouched and beautiful wilderness, the children seem to enjoy themselves thoroughly. They don't know what toys are, but a dung beetle is as good entertainment as a clockwork racing car. Women empty the termite traps, scooping the dead, dying, and are now wingless ants out of the hole at the bottom of the clay chimney. If the idea of eating ants appalls you, just remember that you can buy tinned grasshoppers nowadays as cocktail snacks. Termites taste very much the same. When the winged ants have finished hatching, the cowhide is lifted. Inside the trap, only the worker ants are left milling distractedly around. After the hatch comes the clean-up. There are plenty of dying termites about that neither fell into the trap nor got clean away. These are easy picking for the birds. Fierce soldier ants are on the forage too, dragging dead termites down into their larder.
where protein is in short supply. Termites are a valuable source of food. But there's something of a delicacy too, and a delicacy isn't to be eaten raw. The bodies are tipped into a clay pot and heated over a fire. Termites have plenty of natural fat in them, but you still have to stir them to prevent them from getting too crisp. Then they're tipped out to cool on a strip of cowhide. The last, at last, they're ready to eat. In Karamoja, the women not only do the cooking and farming, but also the house building. Inside the homestead, each wife has her own courtyard. A low wall encloses her own sleeping hut, a shelter for calves, a hut for unmarried daughters, possibly even a kitchen. Practically all the building is done by plastering mud by hand over layers of brushwood. Age doesn't excuse a woman from working. Senior wives have to maintain their own property like anyone else, though they may get preferential treatment. This young wife is building a new sleeping hut, tying on grass thatch in layers over a framework of wood and mud. Inside the hut, it will be cool, even in the hottest sun. It's dark, too. The only light comes from the entrance, which will be more like a tunnel than a door by the time the hut is finished. GA thatching is as neat and expert as anything you'll see on an English cottage roof. <laughs> But if a GA woman's work is never done, her man's never really starts. The GA warrior, one of the finest and most impressive men in all Africa, lives a life of pampered ease, except when on a cattle raid. The men are all six feet tall. In the cattle camps far out in the bush, they sleep on the ground with just a robe over them. Nights in Karamoja can be bitterly cold, too. GA warriors live to collect wealth in the form of cattle, to make love, and to kill their enemies on cattle raids. Though these are strongly discouraged, no administration has yet succeeded in stopping them. The Karamajan men are tremendous dandies as well as fighters. A fully initiated warrior wears a hairdo which is practically grafted onto his skull. Clay forms the basic framework of the whole magnificent ornament. Not surprisingly, it can take up to four days to complete. clay is tacky enough, it is plastered right into the roots of the hair. The things sticking up at the top are metal tubes to hold ostrich feathers for ceremonial occasions. As the clay begins to harden, it is stippled all over with a wooden spike. 
Not every warrior has one of these permanent hairdos. Some prefer them to be less decorative, but removable. That way you can get a bit of ventilation. Yet the headdress isn't entirely ornamental. It's really a helmet to protect the wearer from the knob carries of his enemies and sometimes those of his friends. On the third and fourth day comes the really skillful part, the painting of the clay. Earth pigments are mixed on a hollow stone palette and then run in with splendid artistry. The front part may be painted in four or five colors. The pattern differs from tribe to tribe. Money means nothing to the Karamajong, so the hairdresser will probably get paid in kind, which almost certainly means a few gallons of maize beer. The headdress is now a fixture for two or three years. A GA's hair grows slowly. But by the time it needs renewing, the hairdo will be hanging halfway down the warrior's neck. The headdress explains the excruciatingly uncomfortable wooden stool on which all Karamajong men rest and sleep. It's rather like a woman having to sleep in curlers. Making the stools themselves is a separate art. The roughly carved branches, cut from hardwood, are steamed in a pot to make them pliable. They are held into shape with thongs of raw hide and steam some more. Each time they give a bit, the hide is tightened. But the only thing the GA don't make themselves are their superb fighting spears. A separate tribe of smiths forge these. Nowadays it's illegal to carry a spear. Too many people die on them each year in cattle raids. For Karamajong men, marriage is a long and costly business. Though these young girls may already be living with their husbands, it may be eight years before their marriage ceremonies are complete. In the meantime, the girl builds her own separate stockade within her mother's compound where her warrior can visit her. This young girl is a bride. Her husband has asked for her hand. The families have approved. Now it's up to him to collect the heavy bride price of 50 or more cattle, oxen and goats, which she'll have to distribute among her family. Meantime, she and her friends build the home where she will raise his children. bringing food and cattle as a gift for his future wife's father. It's a kind of down payment, and when they arrive, it's a cause for great ceremony and celebration. <laughs>
Though it's all been settled long ago, the groom still has to bargain formally with his future father-in-law over the exact bride price of his daughter. The reason that the wedding celebrations are spread over such a long period is that it may easily take a young warrior eight years to collect his 50 cows. The high cost of a bride is one of the main reasons for the constant and bloody cattle raiding. So now bride and groom sit apart as token of the fact that they are not yet fully united. At this celebration, it's the bridegroom's responsibility to provide the food and drink, not only for his own supporters, but for the bride's relatives and friends, too. But it's quite impossible for the ceremony to stay sedate and formal for long. The only way to wind up such an important day is with dancing. And this may go on practically non-stop for eight hours or more. Bride and groom, there's no going away together at the end of the day. There's nowhere to go, but anyway, they've been together for quite a long time. Their marriage may even be a love match. Though Karamajan women are expected to do all the hard work, they are not regarded as chattels. Their wishes are respected, especially when it comes to marriage. 
A girl forced to marry a man she didn't like would certainly run away and might even threaten to hang herself. Marriage is taken very seriously among the G.A. Though the groom may marry other wives as well, this couple will stay together faithfully for life. The tribes of Karamoja are barely aware of civilization. They are almost untouched by modern Africa, and yet the new Africa is bound to try to touch them. It may be a tragedy that a fine race of fighting nomads should be expected to fit into the scheme of things. Yet in the long run, they probably have to if they're to survive. One way is through their cattle. Uganda needs meat desperately. The Karamajong can provide a lot of it. Their herds are increasing fast thanks to inoculation against disease. Soon there won't be enough pasture to go around unless they sell their surplus. So now there is a Karamoja cattle scheme and they send their cows to market under armed escort to prevent their rivals rustling them. Katido is the Karamajong's cattle market. It's the only point at which these wild herdsmen make any contact with the outside world. At Katido, a government official is ready to offer the warrior herdsmen a fair price for their cattle. And at Katido, the untamed Karamajong come face to face with representatives of the new Africa. Veterinary assistance in shorts and shirt wielding hypodermic syringes. <laughs> They sit on their wooden stools and wonder at what they see. Does it ever occur to them that their days in nakedness and savage splendor may be numbered? At Katido, they sell their cows for banknotes. The strange world of money can mean little to their simple tribal economy. Even less understandable must be the stranger world of tax. There is one excellent thing at Katido which money can buy. And this one thing has made more impact upon the Karamajong than any other probing attack by civilization. The steel plow has meant that they can make maximum use of what little agricultural land they've got. It's become a weapon against starvation in the lean dry months. And so the cattle are driven away, still under guard, to feed the citizens of the new Uganda and the warrior herdsmen returned to the beautiful, barren lands of the old. In the dry and desperately hot Karamoja, all life, animal and human, depends on the coming of the rains. You can dig in a dried up river bed to find a little water, but it won't satisfy you or your herds for very long. The rains have just got to come if life is to continue. Even the butterflies search for water. Swirling in clouds over the empty water course, the whites and African swallowtails settle wherever the sand gives promise of moisture. The rains must come, and the high god, Akuj, who lives above the clouds, must be asked to send them. 
To ask a favor of an all-powerful god demands that every man and woman does honor to him. The warriors polish their brass armlets with fine sand. Fighting spears are greased with fat and their shafts oil to make them gleam in the sun. This spear will be used to sacrifice an ox. First, the masked warriors carry green boughs and lay them on the grave of a once powerful chief. The dancing begins with a stamp and a shout that might well shake the clouds down out of the sky. The senior elder calls on the spirit of the dead chief to plead with the great god to send them heavy rains, good grass and fat cattle. Women and children join in the ritual too. So powerful is the whirl and thunder of the dance that the high god can no longer ignore their cry for rain. In fact, the rains almost always come, if not that very day, then shortly afterwards. The rainy seasons are fairly predictable in Karamoja. But perhaps that isn't the point. It is the duration and intensity of the rains for which the GA invoked their high guard. When the GA magic works, the rains are not only life-giving, but can be life-taking. 
It's entirely in character with this outlandish and breathtaking place that within an hour, a bone-dry river bed can hold a frenzied flood. When the sun punctuates the rainstorms, you can almost hear the new grass fighting to escape from the brown tomb of the earth. For wild animals, no less than for wild men, the first rains are a rebirth. Congonia with her calf, cheetah with her cubs, they feel the earth breathing again, too. Karamoja. This is the land both the wild animals and the GA were born to. A land as big as its skies and its distances and the great herds that still roam free there.